Thank you. Uh, so I'm sorry to disappoint you, Daniel. Uh, our codes generalize for K codes, and they're not periodic. So this talk might not repeat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'd like to um, start by thanking my collaborators. Nat is here at QC. Uh, Shankar is a fellow graduate student at MIT, and Dave is a researcher at Microsoft. So I'd like to, if you didn't get enough motivation for for K codes, I'd like to add some more. Uh, so. Um, if we have any code uh, that requires repeating measurements of stabilizers for extensive amount of time, such as the paradigmatic example of the surface code, uh, what you actually get is uh, already a trivial example of a floquet code. However, um, this would be a trivial example because we just repeat measurements over and over in time. Since measurements are unavoidable, uh, one could ask a question of whether we can get something less trivial. And Flokekos are just that. Uh, they're defined by measurement protocols that are periodic in time that both prepare a quantum error correcting code but also um, evolve quantum information through the time while inferring uh, error syndromes. And the paradigmatic example of the honeycomb code, which I show here just to uh, introduce our notations. Okay, so it's been two and a half years since the first Floquet code, the hastings honeycomb code, has been introduced. And this is the slide that uh, kind of makes up for like many more uh, phrase that Julia had on his uh, conclusion slide. So there has been a lot of work done here, and uh, just today we are hearing about four of these works. And just in case you are wondering about uh, what's the history of all this, we have an expert in the audience. Is Craig Gidney. Okay, so uh, the open challenges of Plaque codes um, include boundaries, uh, performing quantum computation with them, uh, determining what the capabilities are and what the uh, no go, if, if they ever come any no go theorems, and then uh, further generalizations to the PC code. And our work um, addresses the first two questions, and I hope you get the hint. Okay, so now we'll introduce the dynamic automorphism codes at a high level. Um, so we use the condensation approach that Huli introduced in his talk. And um, just um, what, what we really need from it is um, uh, that the fact that uh, in this framework, measurements become condensations from an appropriate parent code for the entire Floquet code. Um, now, um, Again, to introduce notation, I will just remind you how the honeycomb code works. Uh, so the parent code here is the color code, which is equivalent to the copies of the toric code. And the anions or the logical strings of this code can be assembled into a magic square. And the magic square can be sort of unfolded into two copies of the toric code. And now anion can be labeled either by, by the kind of string that creates such an anion and the endpoints, or by the equivalent notation within the two copies of the Torah code, which is shown on the right. And when we condense one of such anions, one of such bosons, we actually end up killing one of the copies of the Torah code, and the uh, leftover deconfined anions def determine the leftover logical strings. And for example, our X anion can be condensed by measuring our XX uh, poly operators. So, um, the honeycomb code works the following way. So here I'm showing the sequence of condensations defining the honeycomb code. And it conserves logical information uh, because of the following reasoning. So for each anion, there exist several representatives. For example, if we use the first step and the fourth step, which are equivalent as our reference point, and we call our Y equivalent to our Z anion and illogical, um, there will be two equivalent representatives. So if I start with RZ and I just follow it throughout the evolution of the honeycomb code, <clears throat> then um, it is equivalent to RY by uh, multiplication by the measurements of the current rounds. But then this representative is shared between this round and the consecutive rounds. Then RY is equivalent to BY at the round two, and that's a shared representative with third round then that's equivalent to Bx, which is shared with the next round. However, upon following this sequence of condensations, we see that an E anion turns into an M anion, and that's an E M automorphism, which is crucial for the idea of the dynamic automorphism codes. One might notice that E M automorphism is actually a Hadamard-like logical gate, <clears throat> and might ask whether there exists other examples of non-trail floquet codes where a period of measurements will implement a different gate. Moreover, can we have a possibility of implementing 
multiple different gates by choosing different measurement sequences and combine them one after another in a periodic manner and this way implement quantum computation. And that, that would be a dynamic automorphism code. It's a quantum computation embedded into a code. The idea behind dynamic automorphism codes works as follows. We fix a parent model and we fix a reference condensation that gives us a child model. Then we find all such condensations that give us isomorphic child models and we arrange them as vertices of a graph. Whenever there exists an invertible transition, sorry, reversible transition between these two child models, um, we draw a ver uh, an edge of a graph. Uh, this way we can, uh, along this edge, we basically can go between two different child models while preserving logical information. Next, if we choose any child model and we go around a cycle in a graph, we'll come back to the same code, but we don't have to come back to the same state which means that the state could have undergone an automorphism or a logical gate, and thus every cycle on the condensation graph will be labeled by an automorphism or a logical gate. Okay, so now we have labeled every plaquette or, or every two cell on the graph by an automorphism, and any path would define a valid dynamic automorphism code, but not all of the paths are error correcting, and thus we also have to do the work of finding those that are. That will define a quantum error correcting code. So going back to the simplest example, the honeycomb code. The honeycomb code is in fact a part of a family of honeycomb codes, uh, which has a condensation graph. So arranging the condensations uh, of uh, each simple boson into a graph gives us a torus. And um, whenever there is an edge on this graph, it means there is a transition by measurement between two different child models. So now, if we... Um, follow a path that goes around a non-contractible loop on a torus, we get an EM automorphism. One example being the canonical hastings hub protocol. Uh, if we go around a contractible cycle, we get a trivial automorphism, and if we uh, actually wind around both cycles, we again get a trivial automorphism, but that corresponds to CSS Honeycomb code. Why does this happen? Because uh, remember when we were updating the logical operator from step to step, we had to multiply by measurements of the current rounds, and upon completing a period of a sequence, we actually end, can end up either multiplying by something trivial or non-trivial. And when it's not trivial, in this case, it would be a fermion of the Tori code, which implements EM automorphism. Now I'd like to put the dynamic automorphism codes that we have so far on the same footing. So the simplest example, again, is the honeycomb code, the parent model, the color code, the child code, meaning the actual code that is realized at every instance in time is the Tori code. The um, family of these codes gives us only a trivial or EM automorphism, which is not much for quantum computation. In our work, we construct the less trivial example, which we call dynamic automorphism color code, because the instantaneous code for it is a color code, which is two copies of the Tori code, and the parent model is just twice that of the honeycomb code. And that can be done mostly by two, two qubit measurements. Now, uh, I'd like those, those who don't know the answer, to guess how many automorphisms the color code has. Okay, think of a number, and I bet that's not the number I thought of. Uh, so it has 72 automorphisms, and uh, with a um, certain amount of trickster, we can get full Clifford group on n logical qubits from those automorphisms. Then, um, what do I mean by full Clifford group here from automorphism, just to clarify again? So if we are given a quantum computation, that can be translated into a sequence of gates. Now, a sequence of gates can be decomposed into a sequence of these automorphisms. N each automorphism can be realized by a period of measurements, by a short sequence, constant depth sequence of measurements. And then we combine this sequence of measurements into an aperiodic code, and that will be our dynamic automorphism code that embeds the quantum computation in itself. So then we generalize dynamic automorphism codes to copies of prime dimensional Tori codes, which is maybe not of interest for this conference. And then um, we have a three dimensional example, which is a straightforward generalization to 3D, when, where we have 3D color code as our child code, or which is equivalent to three copies of the Tori code. Uh, so that code has an automorphism which exchanges X logical membrane with X times S logical membrane, which is equivalent to action of a T logical operator, of, of a T transversal T operator, sorry. 
And this way, if we can implement this automorphism, we can achieve a non Clifford gate, which we do by two qubit measurements. But now the measurements will be cliff, some of the measurements will be Clifford, non Pauli measurements, and we also require adaptiveness. So now I'm ready to introduce them in more detail. Um, so we have 72 automorphisms of the color code, which are symmetries of the code, meaning permutations of the logical strings. Uh, they're generated only by three operations. Um, let's look at the symmetries of the table. So two of the operations are the uh, reflections along the diagonal, and if you look at the Tori code part of that, you see that the first one exchanges E and M in the first copy of the Tori code, and the second reflection exchanges E and M in the second copy of the Tori code. So these are like symmetries within each copy of the Tori code decoupled. The other symmetry, as is seen out like, oh, by the way, I forgot to say that this has a group structure of real Clifford groups. So we have Hadamard and Hadamard, and we also need an entangling gate to complete this. So the, the gate that is left is C not like gate, uh, which actually is equivalent to color swap. So we have, uh, if we swap green and blue color, and again, if you look at exchange of MM with M1, and remember that M is an X like logical string, so you're exchanging X1 with X1, X2 and you're exchanging Z2 with Z1, Z2. That's why it is color, uh, that's why it's C not like gate. Okay, so how do we actually achieve this? We start with the parent code, which is color code times color code, and we have a layout which is the same layout as for two copies of the honeycomb code. Now, the simple thing that you can do, you can just treat it as two decoupled copies of the honeycomb code to achieve the first two generators. So we just condense or measure um, different, um, Me measure poly operators in each layer separately, and this way we have two decoupled Tori codes, and then we can just evolve each of them separately or simultaneously to achieve those two generators in whatever arbitrary order we want. Now, to achieve the third generator, we actually need a color code, an effective color code. And that can be actually achieved by either condensing a two composite bosons, which is equivalent to measuring a Z1, Z2 at each vertex. That gives us a cup, like two coupled layers, but the effective code of those two coupled layers is a color code. But how do we get the color swap gate? Uh, so the sequence is shown here. The first row shows the sequence of condensations. Second row shows the effective code at each instant in time. And the third row shows measurements that we actually perform to achieve that. So if you look at step one and step three, these are actually same steps, but Step three in comparison to step one has green and blue exchanged. And that sort of gives you the intuition of why, why green and blue are swapped as a consequence of such a sequence of measurements. Um, okay, so how do we get Clifford groups? So in fact, by achieving the 72 automorphisms on a torus layout, we actually don't get the Clifford group. And in order to actually do quantum computation, uh, uh, quantum, classical simulable quantum computation in this case, uh, we would need boundaries. So um, we use uh, Pauli triangle. You might be familiar with colored triangle, uh, for which the simplest useful example is this team code. Uh, but we find Pauli triangles just nicer for DA codes perspective. Um, so Pauli triangle is similar to colored triangle, but uh, for each boundary you have weight three stabilizer that is of a given Pauli flavor. Uh, that allows a logical string of that poly flavor to terminate on a given boundary. So now the logical operators, it encodes a single qubit, and the logical operators are now associated with the colors of the logical strings. So it's red, green, and blue. So now I'd like to make a remark that um, uh, the poly triangle, actually, unlike the color triangle, doesn't have an on-site transversal Clifford group, but we still can do, perform those gates by measurements. So how do we get Clifford group on one logical qubit on one triangle? We just do it by permuting colors, right? Because the colors are now associated with the logical, uh, poly logicals. So we've seen how to permute green and blue color, but each color comes on the same footing, which means that we are capable of permuting any pair of colors. Now, if we have n logical qubits, we came up with a prescription of how to couple different triangles. So we can stack triangles on top of each other and couple them, and this way we add an entangling gate, and we get a full Clifford group. Now, one more remark is that in this prescription, we actually spend finite number of steps on each logical gate. 
meaning that um, there is finite time overhead, but the total computation has to take an extensive, like a distance amount of time for the fault tolerance proof. Okay, in our paper, we actually worked out the entire macroscopics for this, and uh, the quantum computation using this method, the stack of triangles, would involve two qubit measurements mostly, apart from precisely one step of measurements for the entangling gate for one boundary where we need three qubit measurements, but that can be in principle further decoupled by ancillas, by introducing ancillas. Okay, and then the smallest such triangular code will have 24 logical cube, oh, it's, sorry, 24 physical qubits. Now I'm gonna talk shortly about error correction. Um, it's a little bit, it becomes a little bit complicated because we don't have periodicity anymore. So uh, the error correction in dynamic codes is based on introducing a space-time detector, which is, a, which is defined as a, a set of measurements whose product has to be a constant unless there is an error that anti-commutes with the support of, this of these measurements, in the support of these measurements. Um, so if we have, the goal, the goal is to show that we have a full basis of such detectors, such that we can actually perform error correction, but uh, a periodicity actually stands in the way it complicates things. Because if you have one measurement sequence and we want to follow it by a different measurement sequence, so something that would have been a detector in a flow K code might not be detector anymore because it might be either destroyed or never be closed. Uh, therefore, we solve this issue by introducing padding. Padding is just a measurement sequence that realizes an identity gate. So it doesn't change the computation, but it is introdu introduced between each measurement sequence that does the computation. So by introducing these identity gate sequences, we basically allow the um, detectors to round up. And one more remark is that uh, for each, for a given automorphism, there in fact exist many various ways to, m many various measurement sequences that implement the same automorphism, which means that we have freedom to choose uh, a sequence that will be the best for error correction. So now 3D. Uh, so 3D can be understood intuitively, at least, at, uh, by analogy with two dimensions. So in two dimensions, we had two copies of the color code. In the child models, was two copies of the Tori code. Now we have 3D color code. We have three copies instead. The child model is 3D color code, which is equivalent to three copies of the Tori code in three dimensions. Uh, now, how do we do three-dimensional Clifford gate? So let's temporarily return to 2D. Uh, we, how do we achieve G, uh, green blue permutation? We started from we can start from a sequence that implements a non a tri sorry a trivial automorphism an identity gate, and then we take step before last of the sequence. Uh, so step three is the same as step one for an identity gate, and we conjugate step three by the automorphism that we want to implement. In this case, it is a green and blue swap. In three dimensions. We want to imp implement a non-Clifford gate that is equivalent to on-site action of a, of a non-Clifford unitary T, which actually, like, this is a technical detail, but it actually only acts on the third layer. Um, so we want to, yeah, so we want to achieve the same action as a transversal T. Uh, for this, we start with a sequence that implements an identity gate, a trivial automorphism, and we take step three and we conjugate that by t, those measurements by T gate. And we effectively, instead of XX, we measure XS, which is a Clifford measurement. And there is one more caveat, which is for this to work, we actually need to perform active error correction before doing this. So we have to actually run classical decoder, pretend that we are performing error correction, then insert those rounds as a Clifford corrections, and these can be absorbed into measurements again, making measurements adaptive poly measurements before we actually conjugate anything by T. So we just conjugate the measurement sequence, and this two qubit measurement sequence gives us a non-Clifford gate. So in this case, it would be a CCZ. To conclude, we have introduced a new model of quantum computation with 4K codes. We got rid of periodicity, but we embedded a quantum computation into a code. Uh, we came up with working examples, the DA color code, and by putting it on a triangle, we can achieve the full Clifford group. In three dimensions, we can also achieve a non-Clifford gate. And we have also addressed certain aspects of error correction and more general to QFT. 
Okay, so what's left is to put it all in the same, in, into the same framework to achieve universal quantum computation. We also have not completed the program of fault tolerance in these codes. And also it would be really interesting to get LDPC codes and per perhaps implement uh, gates in those biomorphisms. Thank you for your attention. Hi. Um, hello. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. On the the last slide with the non-Clifford gate. Um, so you you're measuring the Clifford stabilizers, and then you're doing. You you said you need to do the Clifford corrections. That so you're measuring Clifford stabilizers. You calculate some Clifford corrections, yeah. and then you go back to the power. Yeah. In reality, you first okay. do the corrections, and then you. Okay. Yeah. Because I was thinking, it seems like you would need to correct before you yeah, yeah, exactly. measure, right? Okay. Exactly. In reality, you correct before you before you apply T, yes. Right. Because then also, how do you calculate if you're, but the correction you apply is Clifford, but it's before you measure, so you've measured a Pauli stabilizer. Yeah. yeah. That's so right. how do you calculate a Clifford? You mean a correction? That's the correction for the randomness of measurement outcomes and for errors. Mm -hmm. Which can be done by stopping sequence, by stopping measurements, running classical decoder, and then determining what the correction should be, and then making next step adaptive. Okay, so it, it's a it's a Pauli correction. Yes. But yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a Clifford correction, but absorbed into by, by conjugating Pauli measurements by Cliffords, you get a different Pauli, right? So it's a Pauli adaptive Pauli measurements, right? Okay. All right. Yeah. Maybe we can. I can ask you after. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I understand that you have a 2D code that allows a Clifford group and a 3D code that allows like non-Clifford uh, gates. Can you do something similar to like code switching to achieve a universality? Well, technically, one should be able to do like dimensional jumping on, or code switching. Uh, the problem is that we haven't worked out the boundaries for three-dimensional codes, which would be needed in order to do that. Yes, but it, in principle, it should be doable. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 